This is a follow-up to our first series called Wrestling with Jacob, The Divine Dilemma. We're calling this one Being Adam slash Eve, The Human Dilemma. The first myth in the Bible, and we don't use myth in a sense, in a negative or a derogatory sense, a myth is an eternal truth wrapped in the garment of a story. And the primary myth within the biblical Christian tradition is the eternal truth of Adam, Eve, and human desire. Within that myth, God comes to Adam and Eve and says, Enjoy the fruits of the tree of life, for they are good, they are nourishing, but there are certain fruits you do not pick, i.e., enjoy the many desires I have given you, but be wary of indulging in certain desires, for there will be consequences of you misusing your freedom. And of course, the story of Adam and Eve is the misuse of their freedom, plucking from the fruit of certain desires, and then the lived consequences of that. As a result of that, you have what Steinbeck calls the living east of Eden. It's very interesting how God responds, though, to the decisions of Adam and Eve as embodiments of what it means to be human. They leave Eden, the place where they could have potentially become what they were meant to be, and through the use of their freedom, they in one sense lose the potential of their freedom. But how does God respond? In Genesis, what you have is God comes to them and he says, where are you? Now, he's not asking in a literal sense where they are and how they clothe themselves and cease to be vulnerable anymore. He's asking, where are you now as a result of the decisions that you have made in misusing your freedom? So when we think... At one level, and this series is really about Christian anthropology, of how God responds to humans, given their choices, it's essentially a merciful, dialogical response, asking, you've made these decisions, where are you now? Where are you on your self-understanding? Where are you on your journey? And I'll return to this as I come to the end of this 10-minute segment. Now, within the spectrum of Christian anthropology, we can move anywhere from the extreme right to the left, and then there is a sensible and judicious center. And I'm just going to briefly touch on these three positions. On the right is what we would call variations of Calvinism. Calvinism takes a position, particularly confessional Calvinism, and there's not a great deal of difference in some ways between elements of Luther's thinking Calvin, Augustine, and then a certain breed of St. Paul, particularly in Romans and Galatians. But the position is one of the sovereignty of God, a good, holy, righteous God, and the total depravity of what it means to be human. And there's this vast gulf between the righteous, holy God and the totally depraved human beings. And then the question is, how is that chasm bridged? And of course, this is where you get Christ uh, is the bridge, he's the sacrificial lamb through which then uh, God the Father uh, sees humans and they become juridically uh, justified because of Christ's sacrifice. And so you get on the far right, which you'll find in the writings uh, of Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, particularly as Calvin's writings become confessional Calvinism, a certain view of human that there, there is virtually no good. Okay, the our will, our mind, our imagination, our desires have become corrupted and as we have inherited the choices, the sins of Adam and Eve. So if on the extreme right you have divine sovereignty and human depravity, on the, on the left you have human sovereignty and um, a certain serious uh, reflection on where is God and can God be trusted. And so, certainly within uh, human history, whether it's the Holocaust, or whether there's wars, or human dis uh, disasters, the notion, where is the eminent God? And is God even present in the midst of war, uh, human tragedies, natural tragedies? Uh, and so what you have is, uh, is that God really cannot be trusted. The Lord is my shepherd in principle, but in practice, it's up to humans to make their own future. 
uh, because God will probably not be there. And so this tends to prioritize human will by diminishing uh, divine eminence or divine interaction. So if you can see on the extreme left, it's the reverse of the right. On the right is the sovereignty of God, the depravity of humans on the left. Uh, is the sovereignty of humans and the dimming or, or silencing or eclipse of God because God just can't be trusted. Now somewhere in the middle, what we would call the Via Medea in all of this, there's a great honoring of the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, the coming of God of saying where are we and also human responsibility. So within the Western tradition, for example, uh, certainly in the patristic era, the clash between St. Augustine and Pelagius summarized that in many ways, in which Augustine took a strong view of divine sovereignty and also a rather dim view of human responsibility or human ability, both in thought and deed, to look fully out of the divine image uh, and likeness. And so the clash in the Western patristic era between Augustine and Pelagius uh, and Augustine, of course, had a, 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 a serious impact on the Roman Catholic Church. Pelagius is very central to the Anglican tradition, and the Anglican tradition has lived within this tension um, of, of divine sovereignty, the goodness and the fullness and the grandeur and the Catholicity of God's grace, and yet the, also the potential goodness uh, imperfect goodness of humans. We also find um, in the 16th century uh, Erasmus uh, and Arminius in terms of the eventually the Luther Calvinist tradition. So we can see in this Western tradition very much this tension in the middle between those who hold a right of center um, but not going as far as the extreme left of center. In the Orthodox tradition you get the notion of synergism. Uh, the energies of both uh, God, asking humans where they are, being part of the deification of, of humans, restoring the divine image and likeness to humans, but humans also participating in that divine dance. To use Bunyan's straight uh, comment, uh, he footed it well and she answered him handsomely. And so the notion of synergism, which is a, in one sense the central position that is wary of variations of the right in terms of what it means to be human and what it means uh, our understanding of God. And on the left you can see in this middle position, both in the West and in the Orthodox tradition, a serious concern about Calvinism, certain aspects of Calvin, Luther, Lutheranism, uh, elements of the Roman Catholic tradition that reads Augustine and Paul in a certain way, uh, and on the other hand, the sovereignty of what it means to be human, and in one sense, marginalizing God as a part of the discussion. And so as I come full circle, we come back to the earlier myth I talked about, is God is always asking in this process, where are you? Where are you in the journey? and I am there with you on the journey, and regardless of choices made and consequences lived with as a result of choices made, I am there with you. And it's out of that we get the notion of divine dialogue uh, between the human uh, humans and God, and I might even add nature in this process. And so we'll move on to the next phase of this. Brad will um, do a brief discussion on the Irenaeus image and likeness and then Archbishop Lazar will follow this up with the notion of deification or theosis, which is so central, so central to the uh, Christian tradition and Christian anthropology. And so with that, I will end my short session. In the second part of our series here, we want to discuss a little bit more about the human dilemma. And uh, as best I can, I'm going to try to represent some of what the early church saw, especially in the East, around uh, who we were at creation, what happened at the fall, and then what Jesus Christ has done about that to restore us. Uh, first of all, who we were. In the story of Adam and Eve, we see a picture of what God intended for us, and that is that uh, humanity was created as the pinnacle of creation. And the most amazing thing about this human creation is that it was very good in that uh, somehow humankind straddles spiritual reality and material reality. In a sense, we act as mediators or we image God in the world, 
because we're both spiritual beings and material beings, uh, not in a dualistic sense, but as whole beings. And so when we think about the image of God, one way of, of describing that would be that uh, God had preserved for himself an image in the world that was not to be carved or fashioned out of stone or bronze or gold, but rather that we had a word and that when we would hear that word and obey it, we would function as the image of God in this world. Another way that we can think about the image of God is that it was an endowment to us of reason and freedom. And the purpose of that reason and freedom would be for our development and our maturity. And this brings out a key difference between Eastern and Western theology. Sometimes we think of Adam and Eve as perfect when in fact they were created really as moral infants, or they were created with potential. And so rather than calling them perfect, we would say that, that humankind was made innocent, but not perfect. Uh, perfection was something that we would evolve towards in terms of a yielded uh, kind of uh, life in relationship with God. Uh, as we heard God's voice and obeyed Him and did what He said, we would develop towards this kind of maturity and, and, and uh, into the likeness of God. Ultimately, this is meant to take us into union with God and Christ-likeness. And yet, uh, something happens. And of course, we need to look at the story of the fall or what was lost. So, humankind, this pinnacle of creation, spiritual and material, mediating God's love into creation, um, runs into a problem in that we end up resisting the will of God and we come into a delusion of autonomy. My will be done. And when we have that kind of uh, uh, sense of freedom as self-will, it's not a freedom, freedom at all. Uh, really, freedom as self-will is a strange form of slavery. Uh, we begin to obey the slave impulse of our own egos and our own self-will. And this really is the essence of the fall, I think. It's a turning from God, a turning from God's will. It's a resistance to yieldedness, and it's a resistance to uh, loving and obeying God. And actually, it's a resistance to our own perfection, our own development. Uh, what God had intended for us was a natural will that was God-given inclination or desire for the good. But when we turn from that God-given natural will, the desire for the good and for love and relationship with God, a dysfunction to our will comes in. Maximus the Confessor called it the gnomic will. And it's, it's a brokenness in our will and, and it's a dysfunction of our will. And the result of this kind of turning from God is a disaster. And it's the disease of sin that leads to death. And this ultimately becomes the human dilemma. Death and the fear of death. And through this, the enemy of our souls has leverage over us. And in some ways, we, we think about uh, sin resulting in death, but also now, our fear of death and our enslavement to death then produces a kind of anxiety that leads to more sin. And we end up in this horrendous cycle that we see all the time just by turning on the cable news. And so... Uh, what we were is, has been damaged in this, and now we walk around as those, in some ways, uh, longing for our freedom, but longing for it in a way that, that chains us up in our own willfulness. Well, thanks be to God, uh, uh, Jesus Christ was not willing to leave us in that, in that dilemma. And so, we'll say a few things about that. One is, that this sin is not simply... Uh, law-breaking behavior, but rather it's a disease unto death. And so what it requires is not a retributive judge or some sort of punishment, as if we could spank a disease out of a baby, out of a moral infant, but rather uh, what, what uh, the disease of sin requires is a great physician. And in Christ, that's exactly what we have. Uh, we see God in the flesh coming into the world as the doctor of our souls, uh, establishing the church as his hospital, and as in the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, finding those who are broken, those who've been beaten by life, and bringing them to the inn and saying, what, 
Uh, I will give you the resources to take care of these folks. And if, if it goes beyond your resources, when I return, I'll repay whatever uh, debt would be remaining. And so this is a picture of really the church as a, a, a hospitality inn that's been transformed into a hospital by our great physician. Uh, really, uh, what God is into is restoration, I think. Uh, God has created us for eternal life by grace, and that grace flows from Jesus. It flows from the cross, it flows from his life, and in fact, uh, uh, to begin with, in Irenaeus, we get this sense of the incarnation is about Christ showing up as the perfect God-man who assumes humanity in order to heal humanity. He assumes and takes up the human condition into himself in order to restore us to that which we were meant to be by grace. And in fact, uh, in Christ's own yieldedness to the Father, he restores the possibility of our yieldedness and our participation in God's wonderful recreation of humankind and what, uh, what our destiny was always meant to be. This really hits a, a high point when we see the cross of Christ. Uh, by one tree, humankind was deceived and fell and turned from God. And by this second tree that we call the cross, uh, our humanity is actually restored and death is broken, the fear of death is removed. And uh, in the Divine Liturgy, we, when we go up for the Eucharist, I often see the, uh, the Archbishop come out with, with the chalice. And as we approach this chalice, I imagine the tree of life being offered to us afresh. And the congregation sings, uh, about us tasting of this fountain of immortality. And so, really, uh, paradise has been reopened. Our great high priest has emerged. The tree of life has been made available to us. And in partaking of the life of Christ, the one uh, Christ and Him crucified, uh, this eternal life is restored. And, and thankfully then, uh, what then Christ is by, by nature, we can become by grace. And I think that would be a good segue for Archbishop Lazar to share on this process of divinization and theosis. inherited or absorbed a kind of Gnostic understanding about the nature of man. And since we're talking about the human dilemma, it's necessary to rather rectify that. That man was created a living soul, body and soul together. Sometimes people have the idea that the soul is somehow independent of the body or separate from the body. And the, all of the Holy Fathers who wrote against Manichaeism or, or Bogomilism condemned that idea, condemned that teaching. So much of the understanding of the relationship of body and soul in the West is based on likely Plato's Phaedo, because Plato had become at some time the basis for theologizing among the scholastics of the West, beginning with Augustine, who was a Neoplatonist. And we get a, a complete misconception about the nature of man itself. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden for a moment and see what the mythos actually tells us. If God created man from perfect love and therefore he created him with freedom because love demanded without freedom is a psychosis, not love. And love given without freedom is an obsession, but it isn't love. So love has to entail freedom, and freedom has to entail choice. And since man was created as a moral infant to grow and develop in the Garden of Eden, he had to exercise his freedom in order to grow and develop. And freedom of will was actually given to him so that he could make choices 
and so he could grow and develop not as a puppet or a robot of God, but as an intelligent creature of God. You see, when we think, why didn't God prevent Adam and Eve from making these choices? Because God did not create robots. He created human beings capable of genuine love and of genuine acts of will toward love. And the temptation in the garden, the two trees in the garden of Eden, both the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, are really prophecies about the cross of Jesus Christ. So that we should know that these things existed and that they were intended for man in the fullness of time. Both the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And man was created both body and soul together as one unit, as one being, as a microcosm of the whole universe, because he was material, spiritual, intelligent, and in all of the aspects of the universe. In fact, man is made of the very elements of which the universe itself is shaped and formed. And man is a point of unity for the universe because he composes, he's composed of every aspect of the universe. Indeed, sometimes we call the brain the three-pound universe. And as a point of unity in the universe, it's very important to our understanding the nature of the fall of mankind. The fall of mankind was through the temptation for desires, of course, the desire to know, the desire to be perhaps more than he was. But in the story itself, how does Satan tempt mankind? Man is the image and likeness of God. But Satan tempts mankind to say, well, don't trust God and you can be like God. God has already promised that through theosis we can be partakers, as Apostle Peter says, of a divine nature. So Satan says, but you can be like God if you disobey or don't trust God. So this act of your will is going to make you like God. And this, of course, is the birth of egotism. The birth of egotism and self-centeredness, which are the underlying problems of all humanity, of every human catastrophe and disaster on the face of the earth. It's our egotism and our self-focus that causes wars that make one nation think it's better than another nation, one race think it's better than another race, and therefore we should conquer them. Indeed, it's the great heresy of racism. Indeed, racism is an apostasy because it presumes that there are some human beings that God did not create, but that he only created the ones who are like us. And these things develop because of the fall of mankind into egotism and self-love and self-centeredness. Now, it's necessary to look at Cain and Abel to see that Cain kills Abel because his ego is offended. It's also necessary to understand together with the Holy Fathers that death is not a punishment of, from God, that man is not an immortal soul inhabiting a temporary shell. Man cannot be immortal by nature, but only by grace, because only God can have immortality by nature, and only God can be the source of life. So the choices that man made in this story are rather typical of the choices that we're going to make throughout life in the exercise of our will. And the fall of mankind and the advent of death, man was mortal, but not necessarily set for death. But when you separate yourself from the source of life and become alienated from the source of life, then death becomes something that must be faced, since only un union with God can bring us to immortality. And when man uh, exercises his will in this fallen human nature, it's still under presumptions. It's a broken will. It's a broken humanity. The, we do not accept the doctrine of original sin, that anyone can inherit the guilt of another. We do not inherit the guilt of Adam. We inherit the proclivity to make bad choices, the proclivity to misuse our will, 
the proclivity to make bad choices. In other words, the proclivity to miss the mark or to miss the goal, which is the actual meaning of sin. And the goal of the mark is union with God. And, but we're still comprised soul and body together. Our soul and our body work together, complement each other, and one makes it possible for the other to function. And consequently, when we speak of salvation or redemption, we're talking about salvation of the whole human person and not a disembodied ghost or spirit, but of the whole human person. So our Lord Jesus Christ does not appear spiritually, as the Gnostics would say, rather he appears in the flesh, as fully human and as fully God. But notice that when our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking, I'm not saying my words, I'm saying the words that were given me from above. Not my will, but thy will be done. And that Jesus Christ is doing the will of the Father. Now some people misinterpreted that to say that Jesus Christ was saying that he wasn't God. But quite the opposite, Jesus Christ, as having become man, is making, exercising his will and making the choices that we ought to have made and making it possible for us to renew our will and to strengthen our will and his showing it's not your will as a human being because it's corrupted, it's subject to fall, it's subject to misuse. But look at what the will of God is and acclimatize yourself to it, not as a puppet or a robot, but as one who has learned how to trust and to have love once again. The trust and the love that were sacrificed by Adam and Eve in Eden that caused them to be dragged down into egotism and self-love. And so Jesus Christ is constantly talking about my God and your God, my Father and your Father, God's will, not my will. Remove this chalice from me, if it be thy will. Nevertheless, I'll accept it as your will. I'm not going to exercise my human will in this case, but I accept what the Father has set upon me. And throughout the whole thing, we see that Jesus Christ was tempted on the mount, and that Jesus Christ is, ex is living a full humanity, together with his full divinity, and always turning the will of his humanity toward the will of God. And this is part of the restoration of our true human nature that, in which we were created from the beginning. And it's very important for us to see that Jesus Christ shows reverence toward God, he yields his will to the will of God, he doesn't speak his words, but he speaks the words of the one who sent him. And in all of these things, he's exercising the fullness of humanity, but a humanity that has not fallen, a humanity that is not broken, a humanity that can exercise its will in a proper manner, freely, having trust and love with God, for God. And this is a great part of our restoration. And this is a way we restore ourselves to being a point of unity of the cosmos itself by following the will of God. We talk about the whole cosmos, the whole creation having fallen together with mankind. As Paul says that the whole of creation groans and travails until now. Not by its own fault, but by the will of him who so subjected it and yet with hope. For the whole of creation is being set free into the glorious freedom of God's children. And why should the cosmos have come into corruption together with mankind, except that mankind is the pivot point of the universe, that mankind is the microcosm up which radiates into the whole cosmos, that mankind as a point of unity for the universe, when he falls, the cosmos falls together with him. And when our Lord Jesus Christ restores the true humanity, then we can see that the whole created cosmos can be restored together with mankind. But to see the corruption of that will is to see how we, as the point of unity in creation, have taken upon ourselves with our ego and self-love to destroy the very life support system that God has created for us 
to destroy the earth upon which we live. And this is a revelation of our fallenness, of the corruption of our will and our choices, and our need for a Redeemer who redeems us not only from the power of death, but redeems us from the corruption of our own choices and our own exercise of free will.